Hello again, everyone. Um, my name is Brad Peterson. I'm a partner in the business and technology sourcing practice here in Chicago and the co-leader with Peter Dickinson of the group. And today our topic is contracting for digital services. We are pivoting a bit from the, the morning's topic of cybersecurity and data privacy and the disruptions caused there to the disruptions caused by these disruptive technologies. And I was thinking about what Raj had started off with. I thought it was great to build a case to say that this is cybersecurity is the greatest threat to all of us. Sounds pretty interesting. And I was thinking, how am I going to keep people's attention? But I've got this. <laughs> Digital services are the greatest opportunity for all of us in the room right now. And so Joe and I are going to try to give you a sense of the emerging world of digital services. And by digital services, we mean services that are delivered end-to-end -end in a digital way. They may be built by people. They may be configured by people. They may be programmed by people. But the service is delivered in an end-to-end -end digital way. And this is a real change. Um, Ten years ago when we started this program, we were talking about a great disruption, and that was offshoring. And services being not delivered end-to-end -end by humans in the United States using tools in the United States, but global delivery of services by a global workforce. And this is a similar level of change, creating a similar level of opportunity. Hi, my name is Joe Pennell. I'm also a partner in the Business and Technology Sourcing Group here at Mayor Brown. Um, there's my picture for everybody who's on the WebEx or uh, watching the screen. So before we jump in, here's a brief overview of our agenda. First, we'll talk through how the digital age is changing the services you're buying. Second, we'll talk about why those changes matter to you as lawyers and sourcing professionals. And finally, we'll talk about ways that you can maximize value and avoid pitfalls as you contract for these services for your clients. So before we jump in in earnest, um, Brad mentioned digital services. And what we've done on this slide is just break down what are the digital technologies that underlie these digital services we're going to be talking about in the presentation. And we like to think of these in two broad categories. The first category is interface technologies, which you're already using today. Social media, mobile computing, Internet of Things, uh, connected cars, connected appliances, Fitbits, all of these are squarely within the Internet of Things and digital technologies. The second category is computing technologies, which many of you are already using or will be using soon. This includes things like big data analytics, which rely on cloud computing platforms, typically like Microsoft Azure or AWS. Software as a service is already being used by many or all of you, and the next three categories are a little newer and more interesting. Autonomics and robotic process automation. So after lunch, my partners Paul Roy and Peter Dickinson will be talking through this in depth, but essentially this replaces rules-based human functions with more efficient automated functions. In your organization's network monitoring might be a typical candidate for process automation. Another example in the consumer area is the Nest thermostat that many of you may already have in your homes, which is also a good example of cognitive computing because it monitors your habits and starts to improve your energy consumption choices for you. Finally, we have X as a service, anything as a service. There are many examples from security as a service to virtual desktop. So as Brad and I go through the presentation, these are the types of technologies that we're thinking about that are underlying these services that your organizations are buying. We are referring to these as disruptive technologies based on a path-breaking book by Clayton Christensen, a professor at Harvard Business School from 1997. Christensen was doing research and saying the traditional assumption that bad companies fail and good companies succeed and bad companies fail because they don't focus on their customers just seem to be wrong. In industry after industry, companies that truly focused on their customers and continued to get better at doing what their customers were asking for were being disrupted by companies with products that started out clearly worse. And so, for example, he said that in the motorcycle industry in America, there, were, there was a collection of motorcycle manufacturers and all were focused on the, the biggest, most powerful, most beautiful motorcycles. 
and they all talked to their customers, and every customer said, I want it more powerful, I want it sleeker, I want it shinier. And then Japanese innovators came in, and Kawasaki came in with a motorcycle that was none of that. It, it was small. It was cheap. It didn't work very well. It was noisy. It wasn't pretty. It was, you know, it was not something that a motorcycle enthusiast would want to be seen on. But some hobbyists picked it up and said, well, this is fun to ride in the desert. And then other people said, you know, maybe if I was a bicycle messenger, I could use this little thing because it weaves between traffic and it's a great little thing. So it built a niche. And then gradually, as economies of scale allowed Kawasaki to develop more and more distribution apparatus and also make the bikes a little bit more reliable, a little bit prettier, a little bit longer lasting, it developed into a product that actually swept all of the, everyone but Harley Davidson out of the market. And we see that again and again. Clayton Christensen said, you know, it's not that Amdahl or Honeywell or, or Spira Unifac were bad companies when they were dominating the mainframe industry. They just were focused on bigger and better mainframes. It's not that the mini computer manufacturers who defeated them, um, you know, the DEX, were bad companies when they got knocked out by the microcomputer manufacturers. And again, we're seeing that kind of a disruptive change. And why is that important? When we go to the next slide, we see that because it's a disruptive technology and it started off as a niche product that was smaller and cheaper, these products have some, you know, on one hand, they've got some great benefits. They are niche products. They're easy to install. They have a particular, a particular specialty that they're good at. Often you can buy them. Um, you can subscribe for them for free. I mean, not just low cost, but no cost subscription. And you can do that as an individual user and scale it to an organization, you know, from the contracting standpoint, almost painlessly by clicking it with a few clicks. And similarly, they have some big deficits. For example, they are often built for a single unique purpose and may not do very well outside of that. They are not built for enterprise integration, the, what companies like the ones in this room need. They are not built, unfortunately, in, in, at least at the start, for data security. And Rajday mentioned that one of the biggest manipulation threats you have is, the inner, is in the Internet of Things. And again and again, when you watch TV, there's, you see people doing the gambit where they change the feed on an Internet of Things device and you know, show everything's fine when, in fact, the crime is occurring. And that manipulation threat goes throughout the Internet of Things, the medical devices and so forth. And we'll also talk about contracting, our area. These products were built up and started as the providers really didn't know whether they were going to be continuing to provide them. They want to keep changing them. Similarly, the providers were working mostly with consumers and people who are clicking on for a single application. They're trying to fill the toehold with a niche. So they're being offered on as-is terms. So they're good, they're bad. What are companies doing? What they're doing is a little bit of both. You've got the traditional factory enterprise ser services, the traditional services that we've been talking about in this conference for 10 years, information technology outsourcing, finance and accounting, human resources outsourcing, and other areas like claims processing. And companies are adding to those a series of new disruptive technologies, emerging technologies, digital services, such as, for example, you might say, I've got a fantastic ERP system, but I'm still adding Salesforce for, for customer relationship management. I'm adding public cloud so that I'm able to communicate with my customers on my relatively public data. I'm adding private cloud for the sort of data and processing that can be done in a virtualized enterprise-ready uh, enterprise approach using the power of the cloud to reduce costs. We are seeing people then have, say, cloud integrators. People might have security as a service, which is one of the, the services that, that Cho mentioned. And you might add even more things to that, like having a sequence where there's a, a mobile app that's your connection to the customer. It connects to a software as a service platform, which connects to perhaps your public cloud, which connects eventually to your legacy infrastructure.
So we're gonna talk a little bit about why your traditional approach to sourcing may not fit some of these new digital services. First, traditional approaches assume that uh, providers are willing and able to customize and change their solution to meet the detailed requirements listed in your RFP. This doesn't tend to work well with digital age providers. We've had some of our clients try and use a traditional RFP approach and they get responses back like, go take a look at this link on our website and maybe you can find answers to your questions there. Not terribly helpful. Um, second, there's also an expectation that you'll be using standard traditional contracting terms that shift the risk to the supplier because you're, they're expected to be the experts in the area and you're purchasing a relatively bespoke arrangement. In reality, you're purchasing very standardized services where the risk is shifting to the customer and the customer needs to find ways to mitigate that risk. Third, there's an expectation that services will be sourced through established channels rather than via rogue contracting by an end user with a corporate credit card. These users are circumventing your traditional contracting and sourcing processes by signing up for the provider's standard terms and conditions online in the very easy process as Brad mentioned. Finally, it's difficult to do an RFP style apples to apples comparison because many of these digital age providers have very different capabilities. So, as Joe said, the contract is a problem and the sourcing process is a problem when you go out with a contract that's in some ways the wrong contract or an unacceptable contract. And if you look at our traditional contracting approaches, one of the things we've always said is, you know, what we're doing is meeting requirements. We're entering into a contract where the service will meet the customer's requirements. It's been our core. On the other hand, when you're subscribing to a service that will be changing, and note the word subscribing, not licensing, not, not some of the words we've used before, but subscribing to a potentially ever-changing service, you need a different contract. Similarly, we built for I don't know, maybe for 3,000 years we've been building on the idea of humans doing work, um, certainly in the last 2,000 humans with tools, and we're switching that. So if you've got a contract which is fundamentally built on the idea of good and workmanlike conduct by reasonably well-trained individuals who have passed your background screening, well, almost none of that works because there are no humans to apply those standards to. You need a new set of standards to apply. On pricing, for years we've been working on the idea that pricing is metered based on some sort of inputs. How many people did it take to do this work? Or how many, you know, how many um, units of machinery did I employ to do this work? That too is gone. There's a large fixed price infrastructure. Most of us, you know, you subscribe to Amazon Web Services, it's hard to believe that they're actually buying more or fewer servers or incurring more or fewer costs because you're there. Maybe if you're Netflix, but for the rest of the companies, you're subscribing to a piece of a large fixed price infrastructure, much like subscribing to the New York Times. It's not that they're going to spend a little extra money because you subscribe. In, and then in the value, our contracts are often focused on, did we get the work done? Did we perform needed services? Were the activities done? These contracts are often not about the activities or the data or the items. These contracts are about the collection, the transformation, the storage, the delivery of data. And so the contract needs to be data focused. And then finally, in this room, not all contracts obviously, obviously there are a lot of short term contracts, but in this room over the past 10 years, we've talked about suppliers taking responsibility for long term critical services. These are suppliers who are adding things to an existing set of critical services, but they see themselves as adding on. And so many of our arguments about this is a critical service that needs to work may not even apply. Joe? So traditional approaches to service integration don't work with these new digital age services. As we talk about the points on the slide, remember back to the picture that Brad showed earlier where your traditional IT environment has gotten much more complex and fragmented as you've added on all those different digital age solutions. Each additional digital provider that you add requires integration into your overall platform 
and those providers often lack the capability to help you perform these integrations. These integrations usually require custom work because service levels and support models vary across the providers. Each of these new integration, are, uh, represent, integration points represent new potential points of failure for security and service, and they increase the need for risk mitigation strategies by the customer. For example, if you contract for a cloud platform, and let's say it doesn't meet all of your different requirements and needs, you might end up maintaining a separate parallel backup cloud platform that you can have online in seconds in case anything happens with your first provider. This situation might come up with your end user computing and collaboration tools, things like email, calendars, et cetera. You might have some of these functions in the cloud on things like Microsoft 365 or Google, and you might also maintain some on-premise email capability. All that needs to tie together and work seamlessly across desktops and mobile devices, and you're finding yourselves with multiplying points of integration and potential failure. And when Joe talks about multiple endpoints and points of integration and potential failure, th think about the change management challenge as you've got an integrated stream of cloud providers or of digital services from providers who are individual niche solutions. They haven't agreed to integrate with each other. You've worked to integrate them together yourself. And want something go, you want to make a change. You want to add maybe a seventh digital service provider. Change management may span the entire ecosystem of, of critical service of these providers. And as you can see on the earlier chart, there may be substantially more providers involved than there were yesterday. Similarly, incident management. If something goes wrong, you know, my mobile app doesn't work. Well, is it my mobile app that doesn't work? Or is it the software as a service platform that it's connected to or the data which we uploaded to the uh, the, the cloud platform for the public cloud, or is it that our legacy factory IT isn't working? And you have to do incident management across a much broader chain of people who are not well connected. Um, on the next slide, I, we, we see a couple of things on this. Um, one of them is that these digital services, by and large, have been built on a very low cost model. That's what the customer base is asking for. That's the, the secret of success. Part of the low cost model is avoiding things like having large teams of people who will be there for your support. Instead, they have online manuals, they have automated services, they have robotic, uh, ro robotic, robotic processes answering your questions and so forth. Um, but probably there's no one in your governance meeting who's sitting up and saying, hey, my little digital service is going to break if you make those changes in the way that a traditional group of service providers, internal and external, within a global business services model would have a team to do. Um, similarly, you've got the business users, the business users. The business users may have had a real connection to someone who was you might have had an engagement model where there was a lead engagement person and then each business unit would have its own engagement person to reach out to. And that might be the way you do IT or finance and accounting and so forth. But then you come to this different model with low cost providers and you would think, I'm not sure that we've got that. So perhaps so what some organizations are doing is saying, this is now an internal governance function. And we're going to build an organization where we can do the training so we will become the interface to the cloud services providers. That too is very difficult. That requires a new structure. And so substantial challenges on supplier governance. So what can go wrong if you're still using your traditional approaches to sourcing to buy these digital services? First, you could find yourself signing up for a lot of one-sided supplier contracts for services that aren't critical now but may become critical in the future. Second, you might be buying the wrong types of services because you're doing inadequate due diligence and because of the rogue contracting we mentioned earlier. Third, you might be undermining your existing sourcing relationships that are working well because you're fragmenting them and breaking them into various pieces governed by different terms and creating a discontinuity of services. Fourth, you may be failing to identify and fully understand some of these risks we've been talking about. 
Fifth, you might not be accounting for surprise or hidden costs that often occur with digital age providers. One common example uh, where you might run into additional costs or operational challenges are complying with e-discovery requests or litigation holds. Customers commonly fail to consider how they'll accomplish these important compliance tasks once they've moved to a standardized digital solution. Finally, vendor management organizations are quickly becoming overwhelmed. They're dealing with increased contracting volumes, non-standardized forms, and negotiations on a one-off basis with new providers. As a result, there's very little of the ongoing monitoring and management with these suppliers that you've typically had maybe in your IT relationships um, after the contracting is done. For those of you who are on uh, the phone listening to the presentation and not on the WebEx, the CLE code is S as in Sam, T as in Thomas, 07, M as in Mayor, B as in Brown. Again, S is in Samuel, T is in Thomas, 07, M as in Mayor, B as in Brown. Could we go back to the prior slide? So, that's, the, that's what we view as the, the changing situation, the challenge of contracting for digital services. We're now moving into trying to give you suggestions for how to face that challenge. And we think that, you know, if we look back at where we were in 2006, trying to identify how to work with an emerging collection of uh, offshore suppliers, um, We've learned a lot over the past 10 years, and we don't have an, we, you know, I'm not sure that we've fully nailed the idea of how you work with Wipro, Infosys, Tata, Cognizant, HCL, and others. So what we'd like to propose first is that we need to reimagine sourcing for the digital age. We need to rethink some of the existing ideas that have been working well for you in the past. And so this is a set of ideas on where you might go to address these challenges. First and foremost, um, we believe when we talk about what we need to do, step one is to learn the emerging technologies and understand what the digital services are. And what the presentation that will um, follow lunch that Paul Roy and Peter Dickinson will do is an example of that. Well, we will be focused on technologies, robotic process automation, artificial intelligence, that you may not be using today, but might be part of your 2020 plan. And the goal is to understand them well enough to think about how to be able to contract them as they emerge. The second piece is to understand your company's own digital roadmaps, because we think you need to get ahead of those, understand where you're going and how you can be part of it. Third, um, understand the key sources of risk. Obviously, key sources of risk depend on where you're looking. There's an overall enterprise risk management standpoint. And to make that more effective, we would recommend that you think of this as a team sport. Um, Raj, he, Raj had a wonderful quote. Um, if we go to the next slide. Uh, oh, wait, I'm, I'm too early. Um, we need to understand how the regulators are approaching key issues. Um, regulators, and we've heard a wonderful regulatory panel on, on data security and data privacy specifically but all of your regulators are looking at these very issues, in part because of the insecurity of digital services, but also because of the transformation in the way that they will be handling data. And finally, um, what, are, what risks for operations generally? Joe, you wanna give the examples on legal? So here, as Brad kind of alluded to, here are a few increased sources of legal risk that you should have in mind as you build your new digital age sourcing strategy. First, digital age provider contracts often permit use of big data in ways that you didn't anticipate, which might lead to inadvertent disclosures of confidential information and maybe trade secrets. Big data is an amazing tool, but if you're the owner of that data, you wanna think about how much value there might be there. It could be quite a bit. You wanna think about whether you wanna find a way to actively protect that value in your contracts or whether you're gonna leave that, that value on the table for your providers to collect. And Mark Prinsley alluded to this in his presentation when he was referring to the aggregation of data and use to improve our services. Another thing you wanna keep in mind when it comes to big data is whether you have permission to do all the analytics with that data that you have in mind. Depending on the sources where you gathered that data, you might be in violation of your third-party contracts 
or maybe your privacy policies, depending on the analytics you perform. Uh, cybersecurity and privacy law, obviously we a big focus of compliance and discussed earlier today. Um, failure to comply with record retention requirements, e-discovery and litigation holds, we've already mentioned some of that as examples of increased risk. And finally, potential export law violations when you're dealing with cross-border cloud solutions. So these are, these are just some of the examples of increased sources of legal risk that you'll want to keep in mind going forward. And in addition to the legal risk, there are risks in many other areas. And I love Raj quote, Raj's quote that risk management brings out the dysfunction in every organization by requiring lawyers, HR, technical people, and the business to work together. That's what we recommend. <laughs> um, this, this is a team sport. You will not be able to find the right answers, even to understand the risks, without understanding from the business people, um, what, are they trying, what are they attempting to do? From the financing people, how do they think they're going to make money on this? From the technical people, how do they think the integration will work? From the compliance team, what are they worried about? Not just the, you know, the part of the compliance team that you touch regularly, but the entire compliance team. What are the issues as far as they're concerned? How about the data security team? What, from a technical perspective, are their issues? And how can we build that into our contracting approach so that we secure a series of rights that allows us to capture the value and avoid the pitfalls? So what are some of the things you need to think about as you're building an evaluation process for choosing suppliers in this new digital age? First of all, you'll need to use requirements documents to evaluate the services being offered. As mentioned earlier, using the old prescriptive RFP model where the provider reviews and evaluates your requirements in the RFP and responds isn't necessarily workable in the digital age. That means that you need to sit down, document what your requirements are, and then assess each provider's solution based on those requirements. After you've done that assessment, you'll need to prepare a gap analysis and identify are there any service gaps from us using the solution? Could those gaps be filled by other solutions? Will you have to come up with your own solution to fill the gaps? These are things you want to think about before you sign the contract. You also want to determine, as Brad mentioned, the financial case for using the solution and make sure that it prices in those hidden costs of integration, compliance, and governance that we've mentioned so far. So, the next step is that your business operations and tech teams will need to prepare a risk assessment uh, from a business perspective. Having done the gap analysis mentioned on the prior slide, you need to transfer the results of that analysis into some type of risk assessment tool and start assessing how you're gonna mitigate some of these risks. Is there anything the provider can do to mitigate a risk? Is there anything you can do to mitigate a risk if the provider is unable or unwilling to do so? After you've determined the mitigation steps, you'll need to assess the overall level of risk that you're dealing with and proceeding with a digital solution. So here we have an example risk assessment tool that one of our clients has used previously. Uh, first, in this example, the risk is that the provider's services are not yet certified to a standard that you typically hold all of your third-party vendors to. So what's the provider's mitigation for this risk? Next column. The provider says it's working on the certification, but it might not get there for another 12 to 24 months. And in the interim, they're not gonna to commit to meeting the standard. So what can you as the customer do to mitigate this risk? You could decide that we're only gonna put non-sensitive data into the solution until the certification is obtained. You'll also assess and monitor the status of the certification, and maybe the provider is being conservative and will actually achieve this standard within six months, say. At that point, you can revisit the risk assessment and reassess whether you want to put more data and more business with this provider. So by putting this mitigation step in place, you've taken what could have been a high level of risk down to a medium level of risk, and that might be enough to let you proceed with the, the, the digital solution. Excuse me. The customer might also consider doing some other things like encrypting any data before it puts it into the solution, but you need to evaluate whether that creates more problems than it solves. So now we're going to move to the legal contracting part of developing your sourcing model. And similar to what we just did on the business side with the risk assessment, 
you're going to actually take a similar exercise with respect to contracting terms themselves, and you want to have in mind risk-based contracting. What that means is that uh, unlike your traditional approach, you're not pr probably going to be starting with your standard terms, which are very complete and cover every risk you can think of. And instead, you're probably going to have to assess the standard terms and conditions that are offered by the provider against your requirements. The best thing you can do is to create policies and uh, other tools to help you handle these contracts quickly so you're not reinventing the wheel every time one of these digital age contracts come in. For example, have a cloud computing policy and a legal terms charter checklist that has rows for common uh, negotiation points that come up in any contract like termination, limitation of liability, indemnities. This type of chart would have columns like preferred position, first fallback, second fallback, and minimum position before you walk away from the negotiations. Populating this type of chart in advance will help you handle these contracts quickly as they come in. As these contracts come in, you'll do a legal gap analysis using that chart and then transfer the results into a similar risk assessment tool to what I showed you earlier on a previous slide. You'll want to integrate these steps along with these business risk, risk assessment steps we already talked about into your overall evaluation process. So here again is this what we're calling a risk-based contracting tool. Um, in this example, uh, your risk is that the cloud platform provider wants a right to discontinue your services on 30 days notice. This isn't uncommon, and a lot of you have probably seen this. Um, because platform providers want the right to be able to flexibly replace one service with a better service as they continue to innovate and evolve. So uh, the provider mitigation in this case is that in negotiations, they've extended to a 90-day notice period, but that's as far as they'll go in mitigating your risk of disruption for a sudden change to your services. So what's your mitigation? Well, you could maintain a separate parallel backup uh, cloud platform with another provider so you could switch to that without interruption. That might not be easy and it includes all of the integration point issues we talked about previously. You might also confirm with your technical team that it's actually feasible for you to export all of your data and applications within 90 days. As part of that confirmation, you'd want your technical team to actually develop the migration plan now ahead of time so that you're comfortable that the 90 days window is actually feasible. At this point, you've come up with some strategies to mitigate the risk outside of the contract terms, and you'll want to regularly monitor the provider to see if anything changes this risk assessment going forward, uh, consistent with what Raj was saying this morning from a cybersecurity perspective. Um, so this is just an example of some of the tools we're seeing clients use to mitigate the risks of these new services. A challenge that we all see in negotiating with digital age providers is that they have managed to, mostly by working with, with their own forms and small applications in a disruptive way, they've managed to flip the process that we know works best for us. And the process that we know works best for us is we send out our forms that we know work, and because 90% of the points don't get quibbled about anyway, we win 90% of the points, and then we've got a good starting point for the other 10%. Digital age providers are doing a nice job of negotiating on their own forms. We need to flip that back. We need to swing that pendulum back toward customer control. And how do you do that? Well, the first thing you need is you need an actual set of templates for digital services. You need to build templates intended for digital, not human services. A second thing to do is realize that you're going to face a battle of the forms against a digital services industry that has figured out that writing plain English simple forms is a very, it, it's very compelling. And you don't want to lose the argument in front of your business people about whose form is easier to work with. We can certainly argue that, of course, it's easier to write something like, you have to pay no matter what, and we never need to give the money back. But that's not as persuasive as having a great set of forms. You also need to um, make sure that you've got a set of forms that you can easily, um, easily swing out and develop as a, um, as a reasonable template in your RFP, as your, as your opening position. And 
a, part, a challenge that we've all had is that for most suppliers, they all have an argument back that, look, you clicked on our terms, you've agreed, you agreed with our terms five years ago when you clicked initially, we signed up an agreement, and you agreed with us again, why are we even having this conversation? We have to break the idea that there are just cloud terms and that cloud gets purchased on cloud terms and digital services get purchased on inherent, inherently are purchased on as-is terms without commitment. We need to reinforce that to be successful at selling sophisticated digital services at high volumes to sophisticated companies, you must offer the commitments, options, and incentives that allow those large, sophisticated companies to be comfortable in using these provisions. And let's give a couple of examples here. One is on the question of what are we buying? Now, traditionally, in, in this room, we've talked about what are we buying? We're buying a replace of someone to take over responsibility for an existing in-scope function and continue to perform it as well as we were performing it. That won't work here, partially because these are genuinely new functions and partially because the services are not configurable enough to match that. So, what do we need? We need to have, for, for example, understand the industry standards that might be enough to get you over the hump from a, a risk-based contracting approach. Second is, work on specifications, the way you work in software licenses, and think about, are, do we have testable specifications that establish a minimum for what a subscriber will receive? When we're thinking about how are you paying for it, the traditional approach is to pay based on inputs, as we know, or sometimes outputs, like the number of invoices processed and so forth. But it's probably time, as an industry, we've been talking about this for a long time, of truly moving to outcome-based contracting. So instead of saying, and we are, when you're outsourcing finance and accounting, that we're going to count the number of full-time equivalents at the supplier facility, despite the fact that most of them are going to go away because they'll be replaced by digital services, we will, and instead of going to, let's count the number of invoices processed, which is good but perhaps not exactly what you're struggling for, can you move to contracting for an outcome? And the outcome, of course, when you're doing invoice processing is how quickly does the cash come back in? How many day sales outstanding do we have? What can you do to actually improve my financial performance? And then that is the next big leap for our industry and our group. Um, on the issue that Joe raised about 90 days before you can change, and the overwhelming issue for us in outsourcing has always been how do we deal with, with change and exit and so forth. We need to build in meaningful change management provisions, but they need to be focused on making sure that the product is not changed in a way that hurts us. And then the other big one, because these are essentially data contracts, is that we need to focus on data. Where's the data coming in? Where's the data going out? How is it stored? How is it processed? Who gets to use it? As Joe said, who gets to make the big data uses? I think we had a slide on that. There it is. Um, and to watch, and truly to watch out, because the digital services providers are intently focused on monetizing the data, including the data they get from you. And there have been you know, big evidence successes of digital service providers who have made vast fortunes offering services essentially for free and then monetizing what they learn through the service. And some of those are, you know, are world's leading companies. Joe? So as we talked about earlier, the use of many different digital age providers uh, requires you to integrate them uh, across those providers. And it actually becomes a key responsibility for uh, integration to allocate in your contracts. Thinking about the integration points that we talked about earlier, uh, Brad slide with all of the new digital age functions and the example that I gave about the email systems and collaboration tools, these multi-supplier environments really seem to work best if you're thinking about these integration point issues before you start selecting and adding suppliers to what is already a pretty complex mix. Our current experience is that the customer is usually in the best position to integrate all of these different functions. This will require more money, more people, and more investment on your part to really be able to do this well. 
there is a market for suppliers to start playing this integrator role across all your digital age relationships, and Brad touched on that a little bit earlier, but it's at an early stage and is really just starting to develop. We're starting to see some suppliers, including some of the old traditional IT providers, try and step into this role, recognizing that customers may not have the resources, skills, and talent to fully take on this integrator role themselves. It's definitely a huge opportunity for suppliers and something we expect to see more in the future to try and help you make these services function smoothly end to end. But right now, it may be falling more in your lap. And finally on governance, we, are, we, we all know that the key to success in gaining the, the value of the investments that we make in contracting is to have an investment in governance and to have a successful governance organization Relationship management is a, a critical component and lays on top of solution, price, and other terms. And while we can build a foundation for a successful relationship, it's essential that there be a team that creates that. A challenge in new categories is always that you need to build a new governance organization, and that new governance organization needs new skills. And we encourage you all to, as, you know, as, as as lawyers in, in what we do on a regular basis, ask, how are we going to govern this? How will we deal with change management across this diverse collection of suppliers? How will we deal with incident management? How would it, will we deal with the very limited number of human beings that are actually going to be talking to us? One way that some of our clients have found very successful is to look at what the base of digital services is. There's a company it's a company called Sky High Networks, and what they do is they look at web traffic at large companies, and what they want to do is figure out how many web services or digital services the companies are using. The procurement and IT organization usually make estimates of a couple dozen or a hundred. Sky High has found that as of 2016, the first year ever, the actual number on average is over a thousand. And that's because so many people are clicking on so many sites and engaging in so many activities. Consider consolidation plays where you go to a digital service provider and say, look, you have, you have 400 customers here, but we could get you several thousand customers. We can vastly increase your volume if you'll sign up to the meaningful contractual provisions that we want and then allow yourself to be governed in a reasonable way. That's a, a new model for governing what right now is um, a diverse and probably ungovernable structure. And then finally, we think that you ought to look at the ways that you work with your software providers. You know, you, you don't have influence all that directly through calling their help desk, but by joining their user groups, becoming one of the, the partners for them and identifying how to be great in the digital future, perhaps if you're, if possibly you're, for example, in the, the FinTech and InsureTech area right now, there's a spectrum of responses, but companies are starting with licensing and services agreements and then thinking of minority investments, joint ventures, strategic alliances, and eventually a purchase in order to take on that kind of technology. Those collaborations are becoming increasingly frequent. You can leverage that as the goal of many of the, the small digital providers to bond more strongly with you by offering to work closely with them in serving your needs. So in conclusion, this move to digital services is inevitable. Customers will need to uh, embrace new ways of managing and sourcing these technologies so that you can get on top of the associated risks. So you want to spend time preparing yourself, updating your strategies and policies, developing new templates and risk assessment tools, creating integration plans, and then adapting your governance approach to meet these new challenges. And at this point, we'll open it up to any questions you might have, and the CLE code is also listed here again in case anybody missed it earlier. Questions, suggestions for how to reimagine sourcing for the digital age? Yes, Lindsay. What are the risks to a customer, if any, in allowing a supplier to monetize big data if the data cannot be linked to an identifiable person? It's a great question because in some ways it almost seems free. And for example, giving your employment data to ADP so that they can announce it and better understand the employment, um, employment
employment in America might seem to not hurt you at all. But the dangers are, first, the, the data might be disaggregated and people might under, people might pick up data that is, you've either promised a, promised someone else that you will not reveal or you, you have regulatory responsibilities not to reveal or it would be adverse to your business to reveal. There, you might reveal secrets about yourself that might allow your competitors to perform more effectively against you. Bill, anything to add on that? No, I mean, I, I would just mention the statistic that probably all of you have heard before that you can re-identify anybody with three pieces of data. I think zip code, sex, and there's date of birth. Date of birth. Um, you can identify 97% of Americans with that. So if you just think, well, oh, well, we're giving all this disaggregate, you know, this aggregated data, nobody's personally identifiable, all you need are those three pieces of information, and then it's all, you know, the veil has been torn off, and it's probably even more sophisticated techniques to reveal data now, not just about people. There was a great story in a book called Big Data, A Revolution That Will Change the Way We Think, Work, and Live. And there, it was an interview with the old chief technology officer from Amazon, and he was saying that early on, when they were just a bookseller, they um, AOL was looking for a data services provider. And Amazon came in and they said, okay, well, we're going to bid very low on this because we don't want to make any money on this. We don't care about that. All we want to know is the data about how everyone in America is thinking. Because at that point, AOL was the web interface and everybody who was doing electronic commerce was going through it. And so Amazon learned what the entire world was thinking and what they want, what the entire online world was thinking and what they wanted to buy. And AOL received a probably substantial discount on its information processing needs. Actually, I was just going to add to that. I think that this really gets into the question of, in contracts, what do we mean by anonymization and the identification because depending on the industry where the sample number is low, for instance, it may be that if that data got out, competitors could uh, determine well, where, where the customer's equipment is located, who their customers are uh, through that. And, and even if the data is anonymized and de-identified, the fact that it comes from the customer, there's some kind of reference to uh, relationship could be important, so it it can it can happen in unexpected ways. We also had a, a deal for a customer that uh, was an equipment maker that uh, was concerned about the patterns and the algorithms that came out of the data that that could be confidential and disclose uh, how their business operates. So I think my takeaway from that experience is you really need to look at not just whether or not it's anonymized but what the data is, what it says, and what the potential secrets are within that data that would be of value. If it's valuable to the supplier, it may also be valuable and sensitive to the customer to have it get out. Any other questions? I thought I thought you were right on the um, the one slide you had with the the digital age sourcing team, right? So I think that's a big challenge for for most companies. The problem, though, is that the you, you I think you have the right boxes, all the right groups that need to be involved. The problem is that they all perform functions that occur at different times, right? So it's one of the big challenges that um, if if uh, when our technical team is is you know at a presentation with a potential vendor, hearing about a new technology mm -hmm. at, at sort of the front end of the process and, you know, are dealing with the, the vendor's form at the, you know, reasonably at the, the end of that process because we're not going to look at their form when they're sitting down at the, you know, finding out about the technology. Mm -hmm. But in reality, it's so far down the road at that point that it's very difficult to solve for some of the problems that we're, uh, we're trying to solve for. Um, you know, if to the extent there is, uh, you know, we develop a best practice about how how to actually integrate that team and deal with the the the, the time elements of that. 
I think that's something that uh, we certainly struggle with, and I assume most companies struggle with. Any thoughts on that from somebody who succeeded at it? I, I thought where you were going with that was, if we figure out a great way to do that, can we monetize that great process? Because <laughs> I, I think all of our clients run into that same problem. We're, we're called once it's, uh, the train has left the station. Thank you. Thank you.